Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible, both from Milligan College, as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for the day. Now, here is Dr. Magnus. Good morning to you and welcome to In the Word, our weekly study of God's Word. Uh, We're so glad that you could be here uh, with us this morning. Dr. Roberts and I are are here uh, for our discussion of the lesson material and we'd like to wish you uh, a happy Christmas, right? Amen. Yeah, (laughs) happy Christmas to to everyone. It's uh, Christmas Eve. We're uh, looking forward to uh, Christmas Day and we've taken a pause in our lesson series on the topic of faith. This quarter we're studying uh, various lessons that emphasize Christian faith. Uh, We're we're taking just a little break uh, to recognize Christmas is here and we're gonna talk about uh, what our lesson commentary calls faithful seekers of the king and that's the wise men, the magi. So uh, that'll be our focus today from Matthew chapter two. Let's talk just a little bit about Matthew, uh, just so we know the context in which this passage appears. It's usually considered to be the most Hebrew of the four Gospels Mm -hmm. because there are a lot of quotations of the Old Testament, a lot of consciousness of the Jewish history and awareness of, Mm -hmm. of the connection, but it's not limited to Jewish people. Yeah, it starts off, um, Its title, that first verse, emphasizes Jesus uh, by calling him the Christ, which is not a name, it's a title, meaning Messiah, uh, a a kingly deliverer, uh, like David, is the idea there. And then it calls him the son of David, Mm -hmm. so it suggests his kingliness. And it calls him the son of Abraham, which reminds us of the covenant with the Israelite people. All three of those expressions, Christ, son of David, son of Abraham, confirm what you've just said. That is the Jewishness of Matthew's perspective. But it is interesting to remember that uh, Abraham was not just the father of the Israelite nation. Father of many nations. Yeah, that's what his name means, isn't it? The father of many nations. And so there's a little bit of reminder there that uh, maybe... uh, this one about whom Matthew is writing is, is not just Jewish, is, is not just for the Jews. Yeah. Uh, Matthew has a genealogy right up front, which is, mm-hmm. is fascinating. Mm-hmm. There is another genealogy too, isn't there? Luke has the genealogy and, and yeah. traces all the way back to Adam. Right. Where, and, and Matthew shows from Abraham. Yeah, so, so. Luke appears to be emphasizing the, the humanity of Jesus, right. whereas Luke, uh, Matthew appears to be emphasizing the Jewishness of Jesus, except for one fascinating fact of of Matthew's genealogy. There's some four surprising people in that. Some women. There are are women, yeah. Let's name them. There's Tamar and Rahab, Ruth, and then what's called the wife of Uriah. Right, who was a foreigner. Yeah, right, and that's Bathsheba. Yeah. We know her. Those women were all in Jesus' family tree. And it is fascinating that Matthew has included women at all. But I think he's included them not only to highlight some famous women in Jesus' genealogy, but to emphasize the fact that Gentiles Mm -hmm. are some of Jesus' forebears. Uh, Tamar appears to have been a a Canaanite who's Mm -hmm. living in the land. where Abraham's family settled. And then Rahab, we know from the story, she's a a Canaanite. Right, yeah, Yeah, Jericho. And uh, may have been a a priestess even, Mm -hmm. uh, some people think, of Canaanite religion. And then, let's see, Ruth. She was a foreigner. Yeah. The family went because of the famine. Yeah, she's the Moabite. And then, as you said, Uriah is always called the Hittite, Uriah mm-hmm. the Hittite. So it's, it's very possible that Bathsheba was as well. Yeah. 
but in the process of talking about the women there, it's interesting that when you come to the birth of Jesus, mm -hmm. Matthew emphasizes the male, where Luke talks about Mary more and her mm -hmm. experience. Matthew brings Joseph in. Right. So we, each, each of the Gospels has an annunciation story, mm -hmm. an announcement of mm -hmm. Jesus' birth. The one in Luke uh, focuses on the annunciation to Mary. Right. But in Matthew, we get the annunciation to Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Who is the descendant of David. And um, yeah. So uh, it, Matthew's gospel is very Jewish. There, the, yes. That is true. And oh, yeah. we're, we're, not, we're not arguing with that uh, assertion at all. But it is interesting to note that right from the start in the title and in the genealogy, he does make it clear that Jesus has not come just for the Jews. Right. It's not limited to Jewish yeah. people. Yeah. And I, I think we'll see that reaffirmed in our story today. It really shows up in this. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. So we're, we're, we're dealing with the story of the Magi. Uh, we might mention that Matthew's birth narratives uh, also emphasize the Emmanuel mm -hmm. uh, God role. With us. Yeah, God with us. So it's, it's in Matthew that mm -hmm. that comes out as well. Well, why don't we jump into our story of the wise men here, and um, you can read for us. Okay. Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Well, you know, an interesting thing about the birth narratives, they don't actually describe the moment of Jesus' birth no. or the, the exact circumstances of right. it, do they? Just after he was born. Yeah, that and that's, that's true in Luke as well. We get annunciation stories uh, preparing the parents for mm -hmm. the event, and we learn about their travel from Galilee down to Bethlehem. And then we learn about the events that immediately follow with mm -hmm. the visitation of the shepherds in Luke and the Magi in Matthew. But the moment of Jesus' birth kind of passes without right. description. Yeah. You know, that's true of the resurrection as well. That's true. The, the moment of the resurrection is not described mm. in Scripture. Yeah. Uh, the burial is, and then what happens when people arrive at the tomb, mm -hmm. uh, but the moment itself. And with the birth, we've taken a lot of liberties in assuming things in yeah. our... <laughs> our art and our Christmas decorations have jumped to some conclusions that yeah. aren't always warranted yeah. by Scripture. L w w why don't we mention a few of the things that we assume about the Magi that clearly are not in the text here? Well, one, it never says there were three of them. Okay. They were three gifts, but it doesn't say how many All Magi right. they were. All right. So there could have been two Magi. They were plural. There could but have been five. <laughs> could have been a dozen. We don't yeah. know. Okay. So 
We don't know about three magi. Even, even in our printed lesson that we're working from here, we, we see three magi, don't we? Hell yes. We just yeah. assume it. it just, yeah. yeah. And camels. It never says there were camels. That's we true. We always assume there had to be camels, yeah. but we don't know they that. They could have walked the whole way. They could have ridden donkeys. Right. Okay. And the idea that, that the wise men and the shepherds were all huddled around the manger, again, the shepherds came the night of the birth. The magi came much after, and they were much. in a house. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, my wife collects uh, creches, nativity scenes. We have several, too. Do you have several? Yes. Well, we have about 30 or, oh. or so. We, <laughs> they, they just fill the house this time of year. And uh, we've, we've done some traveling uh, internationally, and that's what she looks for. We don't buy many souvenirs, but she looks for uh, some distinctive nativity scene yeah. everywhere. And without fail, right. there, there are some little shepherds over here bowing humbly, and there are some magi over on this side, yeah. right? And you have to decide where you're going to put them and, yeah. and try to fit them all in the stable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the manger scene. But they weren't there at the same time. Right. There's, there's no question about yeah. that. Um, you also mentioned the house. Uh, they were not at the stable, whatever the stable was, right. or whatever, wherever the manger was, I should say. Yeah. Uh, they weren't there. They were, they were at a house. Uh, well, let's see. Have we named all the... Yeah. I think the, so, yeah. The, you know, the fact that uh, Herod had the children killed, the boys in Bethlehem killed two years old and under means that the Magi may have arrived close to two years after the birth. Right. right? At least a year or so, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Herod probably added some yeah. just to be safe. But, um, yeah. And it's interesting, too, that we always assume Jesus was born in year one, mm -hmm. Anno Domini A.D. Mm -hmm. But that A.D. numerology was figured several centuries later by a monk yeah. who didn't have all the information right. and made some incorrect assumptions. Yeah, he got pretty close. He was close, yeah. but we know that Herod died before the year 1 A.D. Right. So the birth of Jesus had to be probably 4 to 6 B.C. Yeah, Herod died in 4 B.C. Mm -hmm. that, that's a pretty sure date. Mm -hmm. And Herod, Herod the Great is still alive, clearly, yes. when this yeah. happens. So you're right. Jesus had to be born a little before what we call, mistakenly, 4 B.C. Yeah. Uh, but we're, we're stuck with that system right. now, so yeah. we just have to do that. Yeah. Well, there are, are a lot of uh, oddities that we've at attached to the story of the wise men that have nothing to do with that. Well, right. uh, I should mention some people think that the wise men represented various uh, races from across mm -hmm. the ancient Near East. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one from Africa and Some one from traditions. Uh, Asia. Yeah. And of course, we, we know nothing about it. All we know is that they came from the East. Yeah. And we assume that means Persia or Babylon. And uh, uh, there's an assumption also that they were astrologers, the fact they were talking about stars and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And if they came from that area and had been students of the sky, they may also have been aware of the descendants of the exile who right. were there. And there were people of Jewish ancestry who may have been talking about the coming of a king someday. Right. Yeah, uh, Jews, many Jews did come back when they were released from captivity, but many stayed over in Babylon and mm -hmm. Persia. We, we know the stories of Daniel and Esther mm -hmm. and others like them. They stayed over there, and mm -hmm. they were highly placed people. Right. Uh, and Magi could have been in contact with them. And, and these Magi are clearly scholars, um, probably not only of astronomical events, but of other things as well. And they would have been curious about the scriptures of mm -hmm. this, some of these highly placed Jews and mm -hmm. may well have had. And th there, there is a fascinating scripture in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, that says a star shall come out of Jacob, that's Israel, mm -hmm. and a scepter, the sign of a king, shall rise out of Israel, it shall crush the borderlands of Moab, etc. 
So it, it could be that these wise men have uh, put two and two together right. and put a star together with a royal birth. And, yeah. and so a lot of it. questions mm -hmm. arise about the star and there's yeah. been all kinds of speculations through the centuries as to mm -hmm. what the star was or how it could have been. It says we saw his star right. <laughs> at its rising. Yeah. And, and it's one of those things we cannot <laughs> answer it entirely yeah. or absolutely. What are some of the theories? Well, probably the one that, that there are various ones about comets and meteorites mm -hmm. and, and so forth, but probably the, the most likely is that it was a, a, a movement of planets to the point where there were planets in conjunction, that is, in simultaneous position from, from earthly viewing. Mm -hmm. And that would connote a, a very serious or, or significant events taking place, mm -hmm. depending on which, const, which uh, planets, which areas of the sky and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Jupiter and Saturn, about 6 BC, were in conjunction in the area of the sky that astrologers identified as Pisces, the fish, which was connected with Israel, would lead people to think mm -hmm. something special was happening. Jupiter was the king planet, the biggest mm -hmm. of the planets. So <clears throat> maybe that was what they saw that made them think something's going on in Israel. We've got to go over and find out. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, we do know that ancient astrologers had kind of divided up the heavens and assigned various segments of the heavens to the nations mm -hmm. of, of the ancient world. Mm -hmm. And so if some phenomenon occurred, some astronomical phenomenon occurred in that part of the heavens, it meant some big event was happening in that nation. Mm -hmm. That's just the way they thought of it. And like you say, if it was a planetary conjunction involving Jupiter, then it might be a royal event, huh? Yeah. A royal event. Yeah. They, uh, they, they arrive in Jerusalem, the Magi, uh, pretty convinced that there's been a royal birth in mm -hmm. Israel. Came looking, where is this king of the Jews? Yeah, they, so they, they seem to, to, to know that or to have that, have that insight. Now, whether this comes just from their astrological interests, whether it comes from their study of the Hebrew scriptures that they had come yeah. into contact with, uh, or, or the messianic expectation of, of Jews, that they've come into contact with, mm -hmm. we just don't know. We don't know. Where they came up with this. But, but when they came to the city of Jerusalem and raised the question about a new <clears throat> king, that's all it took for the existing King Herod, Herod the Great, mm -hmm. to go into orbit. Yeah. Now everybody, uh, there was a buzz that, oh, that went across city. the whole city, but probably for different reasons. Yeah. Uh, but you're, you're, the first point that you made is that it really got Herod's attention. Oh, yes. We need to talk about King Herod. Let's, Herod, pause, let's pause and talk Herod about him Herod the Great is a fascinating character. Uh, uh, he was, uh, he was a, an astute politician. He knew how to play the various parties in Rome so that he picked the right group to be with at the right time. Uh -huh. And he came out on top every time there was a change of the guard in, in Rome. <laughs> He was a real survivor. He, you know, uh, there was a period of struggle for supremacy in Rome between Octavian and Mark Anthony. Mm -hmm. Octavian eventually wins and becomes Caesar Augustus, the first yeah. emperor. But, but King Herod, I mean, he wasn't king at the time. Herod backed the wrong horse. He backed Mark Anthony at and first. fought for him, fought for him. Yeah. yeah. Well, then when Mark Anthony got defeated and went down to Egypt and died with Cleopatra, uh, instead of just running off into the desert and hiding, Herod went straight to Octavian and said, I want you to know that I fought for Mark Antony, but I did it because I'm loyal to Rome and um, I'll, I'll work for you now, I'll fight yeah. for you. And he was so convincing <laughs> that Octavian didn't have his head cut off. He, he made him king of the Jews. King of the Jews. So, but he wasn't really a Jew. That's right, what's interesting. Right. He was an Idumean uh, from down south of the Dead Sea. Right. He was not an ethnic Jew. And he married into the royal family, or at least the descendants mm -hmm. of the 
Hasmonean dynasty who mm -hmm. were still there, so that he had a claim mm -hmm. to royalty, a claim to Judaic mm -hmm. uh, Judea background mm -hmm. because of his marriage. Yeah. But of course, he killed her later. He did, out but, of his uh, fear that she would have a better claim to the throne, which right. she did. Um, well, yeah, before we get to his paranoia, let's mention he was great in many ways. Oh, yes. He, he uh, built up a, a strong control of that area thanks to Roman support. He was a great builder, mm -hmm. and built seaports and the temple. I uh, mean, uh, remodeled a, the temple. Uh, there's a, a uh, uh, at Caesarea, I can't think what the, the term, looking out toward the sea. The, well, he built a whole harbor there. The whole harbor, but yeah. you, can still, you can still gather there today and and the acoustics in oh, that. Oh, the amphitheater. In the amphitheater. Yeah, right there. yeah, the amphitheater. It's amazing that it's still uh, there. He built a whole city there, practically from scratch, yeah. uh, a Roman city. He built a harbor, you're right. Yeah, so he was, built, uh, it was just a smooth coastline, but he wanted ships to be able to come in. So he built an artificial harbor out into yeah. the Mediterranean Sea. So he was, he was amazing in that way. But for all of the things that he accomplished, he had a deep, dark paranoia mm. about him. You mentioned that he first married an heir to the Jewish royal family, a woman named Mariamne, uh, and had children by her, but then later killed her and, and, son. and two the, of her sons. The, the saying in Rome was it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is to be his son. Right. Because the, Jews supposedly wouldn't do anything with pigs. Yeah, there's, but, there's a play on words there, too, in, yeah. in, in Greek. Um, yeah, and, and his paranoia stretched beyond his family. When he thought he was about to die, he had 400 priests, Jewish priests, imprisoned in a racetrack in Jericho with orders that as soon as the soldiers heard of his death, they were to kill those 400 priests. Yeah. And when he was asked why, he said, I want there to be mourning at the time of my death in Israel, even if there isn't mourning for my death. Right. Now that's that's a messed up guy. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is seriously messed yeah. up. <coughs> so, but some of his um, building feats are still visible in Israel today. Yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah. Well, it's this man, this complex, uh, successful but deeply troubled man, who is the king Herod that we're talking about here. And when it says in verse three, uh, when he heard that a king of the Jews might have been born from these foreign magi, he was disturbed. He was. And his disturbance was the disturbance of paranoia. He feels mm -hmm. like a new threat to his kingship has arisen. Mm -hmm. The city was disturbed, mm -hmm. apparently excited because of their hatred for Rome, the idea that, that a, a king might be born that could bring them out, because he was not really their king by choice. Mm -hmm. He was Rome's choice. Right. Yeah. Well, the Magi seem to know that a king has been born. Herod seems to know that if a king of the Jews has been born, it's likely to be the long-awaited Messiah yeah. that the Jewish people have been hoping God would send. Yeah. Because that's the question that he brings uh, to the chief priests. He asks them, where is the Messiah to be born? Yeah. And so, uh, the, uh, fascinatingly enough, the priests and the teachers of the law know the answer. Oh, it's instant, yeah. Yeah. They're aware. Uh, they, they, Bethlehem. They immediately uh, quote Micah 5, 2, and they say, well, that's easy. The Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And they, they quote the verse, mm -hmm. which, which Matthew quotes. Mm -hmm. As you said, Matthew likes to quote from the Old Testament uh, here in verse 5. Well, the, interestingly enough then, uh, the, uh, the Magi don't just go to Bethlehem of their own volition. Herod he sent, sent them. He <laughs> sent them. <laughs> because now he, he wants to find out uh, if this child has been born, and he wants to know the exact time, mm -hmm. so he knows how old the child is. Well, eventually the Magi make it all the way to Bethlehem, don't they? Yes. Uh, the star reappears there, and they are filled with joy, they're according overjoyed. to verse 10. And then they do come to the house, as you pointed out. The word mm -hmm. is house, not stable or manger. There's no reference to a manger. And saw the child with his mother Mary. Now, you made quite a point earlier about how Matthew focuses on Joseph. But not here. 
but Joseph is not He's mentioned. He's not even mentioned. So we just don't know. Is mm -hmm. he still in the picture? Or, or I mean, he reappears he is, yes, because afterwards. of the flight to, to Egypt, yes. right? Yeah. But he's not mentioned here. Mm -hmm. And they bow down and worship. And here we get the three gifts, right. which lead to the assumption that there are three um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, we know what gold is. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to explain that. What's frankincense? Well, it's an incense, mm -hmm. but it was a, a rare incense, uh, uh, often identified with wealth or even royalty and came from the East. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a very special commodity. It mm -hmm. would have been very valuable. Okay. And then uh, myrrh is a kind of perfumed oil. Often used with burials. Yeah, often used mm -hmm. with burials. And some people have said that the, the mention of myrrh here kind of throws a little shadow over this otherwise joyous event. Uh, that there may be suffering in the future. And of course, mm -hmm. we don't have to go very far yeah. to realize that there is a terrible suffering associated with the birth of Jesus. The rest of this chapter. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, our story of the Magi ends with a, with a dream, a, a warning dream, mm -hmm. not to go back to Herod. Uh, th their lives may have been in danger. They may have known too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they returned to their country, whatever that was, Babylon, Persia. Uh, by another route. Uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, as in the Old Testament, dreams are often seen as ways for God to communicate things mm -hmm. to his people mm -hmm. or the interpretation of dreams. Yeah. We follow this with the dream that Joseph had to leave, mm -hmm. to go to Egypt, to flee, and then a dream to come back right. later. Which we think of as as indications from God or mm -hmm. guidance from God. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that may be what's happening with this dream as well. Yeah. Well, what do we make of all this uh, on this day before Christmas here uh, as we read through the story of the Magi? How, what, what, what takeaway do you think we should have? Well, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's very significant that here are people from another nationality, another part of the world, another religion, religious background Perhaps. at least, who've come to worship mm -hmm. and the birth of Jesus is impactful for the entire world. Yeah. And that's incipient in this story. Jesus may have been born King of the Jews, but he's been born Savior of all. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that emphasis on Gentiles as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, it strikes me um, pretty powerfully that Herod knew that the king of, Jews, of the Jews was the long-awaited Messiah. He, he knew a lot, mm -hmm. but he missed the Messiah yeah. when it came right down to it. And even the chief priests and teachers of the law, they knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecies. They, they could quote the exact verse as soon as they was, were asked the question. But they didn't go. They also missed the Messiah. Yeah. And th that just uh, reminds me, it's possible for me as a teacher of the Bible, you know, who I feel like I know the Bible pretty well, I can know the scriptures and miss the Lord if, yeah. if, I'm, not, if I'm not focused on Him uh, as I need to be. I need to be seeking Jesus mm -hmm. as well. Well, Merry Christmas, David. Thank you. Same to you. And uh, David Christmas. and Dr. Gwaltney and I together wish you a Merry Christmas. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week when we get back into our theme of faith. Hope, we can, hope you can join us then. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson with Dr. Lee Maggs, Professor Emeritus of Bible from Milligan College, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible of Milligan College. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School Lesson Text. This has been a production of the First Christian Church Television Ministries.